This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I carry a badge. The story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. We were working the day watch out of burglary auto theft division. The boss is Captain Ken Green. My partner's Bill Gannon. My name's Friday. During the past two weeks, we had been investigating a series of thefts committed against elderly victims. Because of the increasing number of crimes having a significant M.O. and the fact that we had no leads or suspects, our first job was to try and prevent additional crimes. Sergeant Dan Cook of Public Affairs Division arranged one means for warning potential victims. He called a news conference with representatives from every branch of the news media. 10.30 a.m., we completed the briefing and all those present agreed to cooperate. One representative was a good friend of Bill's and mine and the department's. He was 15 minutes late. Never fear, Whitting Hill's here. Looks like I'm a touch late, doesn't it? No problem, Dick. How are you? Fine. Couldn't be better. What do you two guys got on your devious minds? Dan Cook said something about a news conference. Now, it's a little more than just a news conference, Dick. We need your help. Name it. Well, we've asked the newspapers, radio, and TV people to engage in a little crime prevention for us. Well, you mean they lock your car or never give a burglar an even break campaign? No, not this time. There's a new M.O. that's popped up during the last few weeks, Dick. We're having a hard time finding a suspect, and we'd like to prevent as many scores as we can before she's apprehended. She? Right, one woman, between 30 and 35, uses the names Davis or Marshall, Picks elderly people as her victims and steals them blind. Sounds like a real nice lady. That's exactly the problem we're dealing with. Her M.O. is she's extremely nice and helpful. We've had 16 reports during the past two weeks. Same thing every time. Suspect picks out a house usually occupied by elderly pensioners, knocks on the door and goes into her act. Which is? Well, first, she tells her victims that she was sent out by an employment agency for a domestic job. When the victims say they don't know anything about it, she goes into an act of being surprised and disappointed. After a little more conversation, she cons her way to get inside the house. How does she manage that? Usually, she wants to use the telephone to check back with the employment agency. Does she make a call? We don't know, but she goes through the motions of making one. When she hangs up, she tells them a mistake had been made, and she thanks the people for their kindness. And that's it? Oh, no. That's where the performance really starts. She always wants to repay them for being so kind, and the victims go for it. Repay them? How's that? Well, usually anything she can do to be helpful, you know, straighten a pillow, read them a story, turn the radio on, put something away that's too heavy for the old people to lift. She gives them a real strong Good Samaritan routine. Well, how's she take them? What's the con? No con to it. She tries to find a way to get into another room where valuables are kept. Then she takes what she can, usually money or jewelry, makes a smooth exit before the victim knows what happened. She's a regular Florence Nightingale. That's about it. Easy targets and poor witnesses. What better victims can a hoodlum find? You have any leads on who she is? No, not so far. It's at a point now that we've asked all patrol divisions to call us direct for the preliminary investigation. When the pattern started building, we requested CII up in Sacramento to make an M.O. check. That should be back any day now. But they might not turn up anything. That's why we need your help, Dick. It's becoming an epidemic. And you're asking for me to tell a story about this nice lady on my radio program. That's it. As many times a day as you can work it in. Well, I'm glad to help, Joe, but don't you think a lot of publicity will scare the suspect off? We're willing to take that chance, Dick. I'd rather try to prevent new jobs than wind up catching her after she's fleeced a dozen or more old people. Okay, makes sense. I'll give it everything I can. We appreciate it, Dick. One more thing. What's that? When you put out the story, encourage your listeners to call us if they're approached by anyone that might fit our suspect, will you? Will do. What's your number down here? Madison 405211. Got it. Hope I can do you some good. And so do we. Burglary Auto Friday. Yes, sir. What's that address? Yes, sir. We'll go right out. Wilshire Division Watch Commander. Looks like our helpful woman hit again. A couple in their 70s. She really must have sent her conscience out to lunch. Most thieves do. Ten fifty a.m. We drove to the latest victim's home at sixteen twenty Kelmore Street. We identified ourselves to Martha Anderson, the wife of seventy-seven-year-old Chester Anderson. 
Mrs. Anderson was 72. What are you boys gonna do about it? Are you gonna nab her? Yes, sir, we're gonna try, if you'll tell us what happened here. I'll tell you what happened. That young lady thief took all our money. That's what happened. I still can't believe it, Sergeant. She was such a nice young woman. Did she tell you her name? Yes, she introduced herself as Miss Davis. She was a phony. All that sweet talk and making over everything. All right, sir, now why don't we go back to the beginning and you can tell us how it all started. It was yesterday afternoon, Sergeant. I'll tell it, Martha. You fix these boys and me a little nip. Thanks just the same, Mr. Anderson. Well, you don't know what you're missing, son. It's the best sour mash there is. I'm sure it is, Mr. Anderson. It's just a little early yet. Oh, uh, you younger generation just don't know how to live. That's why we got a gap. You're not having any either, Chester. You know what the doctor said. No, that soft-headed know-it-all. I say, if you can't enjoy life, then you might just as well buy a plot and climb into it. You know what I mean, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I think so. Now, about this lady. She ain't no lady. She's a two-bit thief. Oh, Chester, he insists she took the money, Sergeant. I finally agreed to call, but I'm not convinced that she did take it. She took it all right. There's nobody else could have. Oh, she was a sweet, kind woman looking for work. They sent her to the wrong address is all. Did she tell you that, ma'am? That Jezebel told her all kinds of things. I saw through her right off. It was about 5 o'clock yesterday evening. I answered the door, and there she was. Said she was sent out by the employment agency. Did she mention which one, ma'am? Yes, sir. As I recall, it was Apex. Yes, the Apex Employment Agency. That's a phony if I ever heard one. Yes, sir. Would you go ahead, please, ma'am? Well, she told me they'd sent her out to be interviewed for a job as a maid and practical nurse. When I told her we didn't know anything about it, the poor thing got real worried and upset, you know? Yes, ma'am. Now, where did this conversation take place? It was all on the front porch out there. She asked to use the telephone, you know, to find out if there was a mistake. Yeah, that's how she finagled her way in the house, asking to use the telephone. <laughs> That's some dodge, ain't it? Did she make a call? Yes, I showed her to the phone and she called the employment agency. The conversation was quite long. About 25 units worth. Yes, sir. Did she say anything after she hung up? The employment agency had made a mistake. She was terribly upset. Upset, hogwash. She was all put on. Well, maybe. But she was so sincere. She apologized for inconveniencing us and asked if she could help with anything. No charge, of course. Yeah, no charge. Sure costs us enough in the long run, though. What happened then? Oh, we started talking about this and that. You know, she asked how long we'd been married and how many children we had. That's what you policemen call getting a person's confidence, ain't it, Sergeant? Wasn't any of her business at all. Yes, sir. Now, where was the money that's missing? In my purse in the kitchen. Three hundred dollars. Did the woman ever go into the kitchen by herself? She sure did. That's why I keep saying she took it. Nobody else could have. Well, now, what were the circumstances that got her into the kitchen by herself? My stomach pills. It was time for Chester to take his digestion pills. I was about to get a glass of water, and she offered, told me to just sit still. She was so nice about it. That's when she stole our money. We didn't find out about it till this morning. I went to pay the milkman, and it was gone. All of it. Well, now, is there any possibility someone else could have taken it? No, sir, Sergeant. Nobody else has been here, and Martha locks up tight at night. It's just so hard to believe that dear woman could do such a thing. But Chester's right. No one else could have taken it, and I know I had the money just before she arrived. Well, how do you know that for sure, ma'am? Did you check it? Yes, sir. It was the money from our Social Security checks. My neighbor, Mrs. Parker, cashed them for us at the market. When she brought the money back, I counted it and put it right in my purse. It wasn't ten minutes later that lady came. She read out loud to us. I beg your pardon, sir? You tell her, Martha. That's why my wife just can't believe that woman took our money. After she came from the kitchen, she read aloud to us the 23rd Psalm from the Bible. Twelve ten p.m. After completing a crime report and arranging with Leighton Prince to dust Mrs. Anderson's purse, we returned to the office. The M.O. request we had made to C.I.I. arrived from Sacramento. They turn anything? Yeah, there's something more than a no-hit letter in here. Looks like that C.I. computer's put in a good day's work. Yeah, three possibles on our M.O. description. Wilma Tam, female Caucasian, 35, arrested six times in the past four years. Burglary and petty theft, all arrests up in Oakland. Thelma Musset, female Caucasian, 40, 14 arrests, three for burglary. The cover letter here says she's doing one to five. That lets her out. Number three, Evelyn Gentry. Female Caucasian, 32, one arrest for burglary, Pasadena, California, three years ago. 
What was the dispo? Released insufficient evidence. Not much to go on. Three possibles in the entire state, and one of them's in jail. Well, that leaves us two to work on. Yeah, no telling where either one of them is. Where to now? I say we start with our neighbor to the north. The home of the Rose Bowl. A telephone call to the Pasadena Police Department located the investigator that had handled the Evelyn Gentry case three years prior. After a short conversation, we knew he had information which would make a trip to Pasadena worthwhile. Sergeant Bert Crow of the Pasadena Police Department Detective Bureau was well prepared and happy to see us. How many hits have you had over there in L.A.? We had number 17 yesterday. Yeah, she's doing okay. How long has it been going on? Well, the first report came in about two weeks ago. No telling how many have gone unreported. I know what you mean. We haven't had one similar occurrence since I picked up this gentry woman three years ago. I'd like to look over my case package. All the reports are there. Thanks, Bert. How many hits have you had? Before we got her? That's right. Five. All old people. The youngest victim I had was 80. The oldest, 94. She operated about a month before we nailed her. Have you come across this Evelyn Gentry since you picked her up three years ago? No, I'm delighted to say. In fact, I was kind of surprised when you called. Well, how's that, Bert? Well, as you probably know, we lost the case. But picking her up had a residual effect. As soon as the judge kicked her loose, she left town. Went back east somewhere. I watched her board the train. Maybe she came back, Bert, according to your reports. Employment agency scam, nice, pleasant, helpful personality, elderly victims, the whole bit. Yeah, but it still doesn't make us a case, does it? be an easy M.O. to copy. That's evidence by the fact that C.I.I. had two others. Have you shown her mugshot around you? No, we haven't. We just got the C.I.I. info this morning. Thought we'd check your end out first. I'm glad you did. Take my advice before you go back to all your victims with pictures. Get them blown up to at least 8 by 10. Poor eyesight, huh? You would better believe it, among other reasons. That contributed to our losing the case. When you count on eyewitness testimony and the witness doesn't see too well, stand by to lose your case. How did you find her three years ago? Lucky break. I had a concerned citizen. One of my victim's neighbors noticed a strange car in the neighborhood and wrote down the license number. Later that day, she saw a policeman taking a report and gave it to him. It paid off. We checked with DMV, and based on the description given by the victim, we picked up Evelyn Gentry at her home. Was the victim a good witness? The best I had out of five, 87 years old. Is that right? He died of a coronary before we got to trial. The other four either had bad eyesight or were just too old to give understandable testimony. Rough way to lose a case. Yeah, and Evelyn Gentry was enjoying herself all the way. No cop out, huh? Not on your life. I gave her the Miranda. She stood on the whole enchilada, not a peep. Okay. Thanks a lot, Bert. You guys do me a favor if you find her. Well, yeah, sure. Don't scare her back into Pasadena. Wednesday, October 10th, 8.35 a.m. Acting on the advice of Sergeant Bert Crow, we obtained 8 by 10 inch blow-up photos of Evelyn Gentry, Wilma Tam, Thelma Musset, and two police women for examination by the victims. Do you have any other evidence going for you beside this photo show? Up? We ought to know any time now, Captain. Leighton Prince lifted one partial off the Anderson woman's purse yesterday. Now we've got fingerprint cards from CII on two of our potential suspects, Wilma Tam and Evelyn Gentry. Print man's on his way up now. And if this doesn't pan out, what do you have in mind? A lot of footwork with these mug shots. Morning, gentlemen. Morning, Carl. Thanks for coming up. Did you do any good? Right here, DR number 69532960, right? You had the cards? Okay. Yep. And that does it. There's your suspect. Evelyn Gentry. Is it solid? Oh, it's hers, all right, but not good enough for court. How many points did you make? Seven. Three short. Yep. Three more, and you would have had her flat out. But it's her, all right. I just can't say so in court where it counts. Well, it's a start. Thanks, Carl. Anytime. We couldn't have used it by itself anyway. Why not? Not conclusive. She went in that purse. No, the print was lifted from the outside just below the snap. Reasonable doubt, huh? That's it, Skipper. Well, you two know what's next. Yeah, legwork. Lots of it. I get it. Burglary Auto Friday. Yes, ma'am, this is the police department. What's that address? No, ma'am, you wait right there. We'll be out in 20 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Maybe we got a break. What's that? A lady out on Redwood Street heard about the M.O. on the radio. She listens to Whitting Hill. Says it was a young woman matching the general description at her neighbor's house about 15 minutes ago. Now, the neighbor was gone, but this woman was watering the lawn for her. Did she talk to her? Yes, sir, she did. The woman didn't state her business, but she said she'd return at 10 o'clock. Why 10? Well, now, the woman on the phone, she told the suspect that's the time her neighbor would return home. Will she? Mrs. Kissinger, that's the neighbor, got home about five minutes ago. She wants to play it out. What'd she have in mind? A stakeout. She has a room we can watch from. <laughs> Nine 
9.30 a.m. Upon arriving at the home of Edna Kissinger, we briefed her on the methods necessary for a successful stakeout. 10.35 a.m., an hour had passed. We waited. Yeah, it looks like we've drawn a blank. Yeah, and our potential victim looks like she's getting a little nervous, doesn't she? Yes? Mrs. Kissinger, I'm Betty Matthews from your local Red Cross chapter. Uh, you've been recommended as a possible volunteer. Oh? Oh, yes, I always help the Red Cross. Well, I wonder if this year you might like to help with our blood donor program. Would, would you like to volunteer? Eleven oh five a.m., Bill and I started the footwork by contacting each of the 17 known victims. 4.10 p.m., we had contacted 16 of the 17 victims. Two were positive and 14 unsure that Evelyn Gentry had stolen from them. 4.30 p.m., the most recent victims, Chester and Martha Anderson, were contacted and asked to look at the mug shots. They were both positive that Evelyn Gentry was the suspect who had taken their money. 5.30 p.m., we returned to the office. You two putting in some overtime, huh? Yes, sir, but right now we've run out of road. The Kissinger thing went nowhere. How'd the victims pan out? Well, four of them can positively ID the gentry woman. And that's the end of the line. Best thing to do now is get an arrest warrant, file it in R&I. Maybe a radio car will stumble across her. If we could locate her and run a tail, even with our eyeball witnesses, the only thing that'll cinch a case is to grab her right after one's gone down. Yeah, but what's ideal and what's real are two different bags of fish. Right now, we gotta try to just get her off the street with a warrant. <laughs> Burglary Auto Green. Yeah, right here. I'll say this, this deal is sure making you popular. This Friday. Yes, ma'am. What'd she look like? What's that address? We'll be right out. A woman by the name of Bessie McDermott. She listened to Whitting Hill this morning. She says she was feeding her neighbor's cat when a woman matching Evelyn Gentry's description knocked on the neighbor's front door. The neighbor's an old man in the hospital, but the McDermott woman told the suspect he was at the doctor's office, said she was trying to help. Sounds like she did. This Mrs. McDermott told the suspect the man would be back around 7 tonight. Yeah. Well, now, as far as she knows, the suspect is coming back. Ms. McDermott said we could use the old man's house. He'll okay it. Could be another wild goose chase. Maybe not, Captain. How's that? Suspect told Mrs. McDermott that she was sent out by an employment agency. <laughs> 6.20 p.m., we arrived at the subject location in the Hollywood area and were met by Mrs. Bessie McDermott, the neighbor who was caring for the home of Andrew Jennings during his stay in a nearby hospital. I just love that Dick Whittinghill, him and his story records. He's a riot! <laughs> well, anyway, I was listening to him this morning, and that's what gave me the idea. What idea was that, ma'am? That awful woman stealing from old people. When I answered the door and she said the employment agency sent her, I played it real cool, you know. Well, I said, Bessie, I said, let's us catch her in the act. So I told this woman, I didn't know whether he was looking for a day maid or not. I was just overfeeding the cat, you know? Well, that's what I told her. Yes, ma'am. Now, did this woman say she'd be back? Sure did. I told her Mr. Jennings would be home around 7. That's not really what did it. What's that, ma'am? I set her up real good for you, Sergeant. She asked me if Andrew was an invalid. I'm sure she spotted this wheelchair right here. I told her he was, and that a friend had taken him to the doctor. But here's the real clincher. Are you ready? Yeah, go ahead, ma'am. I told her that once a month, Andrew and his friend go out to dinner after Andrew gets his disability check cashed. Well, let me tell you, she lit up like a Christmas tree on Hollywood Boulevard. Do you recognize any of these women, Mrs. McDermott? Well, I'll sure give it a try. Uh-uh. Nope. No, that's not her. Uh-uh. Oh, this is the one, all right. That's her for sure. Evelyn Gentry. Oh, I want to see you men get that weasel. Six forty-five p.m. Bill and I prepared for the arrival of Evelyn Gentry. A decoy wallet with identified money was made ready. We agreed Bill would assume the role of Andrew Jennings, and I would cover from an adjoining room. Seven thirty p.m. The suspect was thirty minutes late. We waited. 7.50 p.m. The suspect had still not shown. I don't mind telling you, I'm beginning to feel old sitting in this wheelchair. Just hang in there, partner. We gotta give it at least another hour. By that time, we'll be able to use my social security check for evidence. 
There's somebody coming up the walk. Now it's too dark to tell for sure, but we got a visitor. Come on in, Bessie. Well, I'm not Bessie, but I'll be happy to come in. Oh, I thought you were my neighbor, Bessie McDermott. She's got my cat, always feeds it when I'm out. Can I help you? Well, I hope I can help you. I was sent out by the Apex Employment Agency. You wanted a day maid? Must be some mistake. I don't need a maid. I didn't talk to any employment agency. Well, this is 1002 West Reddington Street, isn't it? That's the address, all right, but I still didn't call for anybody. Oh, there must be an awful mistake. This is where they sent me. Well, I'm sorry, miss. I can't understand it. Would you be so kind as to let me use your telephone? Oh, sure. Go right ahead. It's over there. Thank you so much. I won't be a minute. Hello? This is Miss Davis. Has Mr. Caldwell gone home? Oh, yes. I'll wait. Oh, hello, Mr. Caldwell. I'm glad I caught you. This job that you sent me on, the gentleman here indicates that he hasn't asked for a domestic. Yes, I have 1002 West Reddington. Oh, I see. Yes, all right. Thank you very much. You know, it was all a silly mistake, Mr. Mr. Jennings, Andrew Jennings. Mr. Jennings, I'm Ann Davis. Oh, well, nice to know you, Miss Davis. The mistake is, I'm supposed to be at 1002 East Reddington instead of West. Now, isn't that silly? Oh, I wouldn't say that. It's an understandable mistake. Oh, pardon me for staring. I was just thinking how lonely you must be, confined as you are. Well, I do a lot of reading and whatnot. I know what you mean, you poor dear. How long has it been? You mean being stuck in this contraption? Since the war, hand grenade. My, you're a veteran. Well, you've certainly given a lot for your country, haven't you? Oh, I can't complain. Uncle Sam's taken pretty good care of me. Well, if it was up to me, we'd reward our heroes with much more than we do. Oh, I can't rightly say I'm a hero, Miss Davis. Anne, call me Anne. You know, just sitting here makes me so proud. Well, it's nice of you to say so. This certainly is a nice house you have here, Andrew. Would you excuse me just a minute? I've got to get some water. Time for my pills. You'll do no such thing while I'm here. I'll get it for you. That's real nice of you. There's a glass in the kitchen there by the sink. I'll find it. You just sit right there and relax. Sure is nice having a woman around. You never know how much you miss a wife till she's gone. Of course, it's been a long time for me. I should be used to it by now. I understand. I'm just glad to help out. I wish I could afford a maid. I'd sure hire you. There you are. Thank you. Well, it sure has been nice talking with you, Andrew. Do you have to go already? I really must. The job, you know. And I am at the wrong address. Oh, that's right. Well, thank you for your kindness. Oh, you're entirely welcome, Andrew. You're a dear man. Goodbye. All right, hold it right there, lady police officers. You've really got your nerve, haven't you? Why not? You've had yours long enough. The story you have just seen is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On November 3rd, trial was held in Department 184, Superior Court of the State of California for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. The court found the suspect guilty of burglary in the second degree, which is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year or the state prison for not more than 15 years.